Two guests. One is going to be our keynote speaker today. The first is Ed Gillespie. He was chairman of the RNC. He was senior advisor to President Bush, and he's running. Well, I don't know if he's announced yet. He has. He's running for governor of Virginia this year, and he. Um, we're honored to have Ed, Ed with us today. And John Bork was our president from 1997 to 2003. Back in the 90s, Liberty was still struggling financially. We were restructuring debt. We were trying to get Liberty on firm footing for the future. And we went through a Sachs reaffirmation visit in 1996. And we, we didn't get a clean bill of health like we did this past, this past year. We had lots of problems with the, with the financials and with the supporting the academic program. So we hired some consultants who were very well respected with the Southern Association. John Boric was one of them, and we were so impressed with him. He and I became friends. I was general counsel at the time, and we um, ended up hiring John to be our president. He came up the next year, and he literally helped us transform Liberty into a self-sustaining, financially self-sustaining university. He helped us separate it from other ministries here that were, that were all, it was all sort of one, one big organization at that time. And he, I can't say enough about what an incredible job he did to improve Liberty academically, financially, and he stayed until 2003. And he um, has remained a good friend of ours. And I just wanted you to hear from him because because he, we have some great memories back when times were tough, and it's those times that make you appreciate the prosperity that Liberty has is, is been, been blessed with today. So I'm going to continue the tour of campus with our special guests, and I'm going to turn it over to Congressman Robert Hurt at this time. Thank you. Good morning. It's uh, wonderful to be here this morning, and uh, bef thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, President Falwell, uh, before I get started, I did want to, uh, to, to also recognize a, a friend of ours here uh, at Liberty, somebody who is serving us in the United States Congress now. He's chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, somebody who actually represents uh, the most part of uh, Liberty, at least for the time being, uh, here in the, in the city of Lynchburg, but uh, is our friend Bob Goodlatte, who has uh, joined us on his way back to, to Washington this afternoon. Bob, thanks for being here. It's an honor for me to be able to introduce our, uh, one of our special guests today. Uh, he has a long uh, uh, and celebrated career. Uh, as uh, President Falwell said, uh, Ed Gillespie served uh, in the George uh, Bush White House uh, for a, a number of years uh, as a senior advisor, sitting uh, in the Oval Office with the President when the most important decisions of life and death uh, were made as it relates to our, our soldiers. Uh, so you can imagine the kind of experience that, uh, that he brings uh, to his race for governor. We're delighted that he was able to stop by here for a few minutes this morning. Uh, one of the things that I think uh, that uh, is especially important about his background uh, is the fact that in 1994 uh, he was a part of uh, the Congress. He was working for Dick Army at a time when, they, this is of course t two years probably before many of you were born uh, in 1994. Uh, but came up with a contract for America. And, and I think that while it may seem like ancient history to you, in so many ways it's so important for us today because when you look at, I think, what's going on in Washington now, you look at the Supreme Court choice and the lists that uh, were made, the promises that were, have been made and the promises that, uh, that need to be kept, I think you can look back to the contract for America uh, as one of, the, one of those things that has been a guiding principle as, as, uh, as we hope to see our country uh, flourish. I spoke a little bit uh, with Ed about his speech today. I can tell you, you have a lot to look forward to. Uh, he is an uncommon man. He's an uncommon leader. I know this for a fact, uh, that what he's going to tell you today comes from his heart. And uh, he wrote himself, didn't have a speech writer write it. Uh, and so I think it's going to be especially meaningful. Uh, he is, uh, we're so delighted to have him here. I am uh, proud to be able to call him a friend. Uh, so I give to you, Ed Gillespie.
Robert, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. More important, thank you for your leadership here and inviting me here. I appreciate President Falwell and all of you allowing me to return and come through your doors once again. It's an honor to share the stage with Robert Hurt and with Dr. Boric, and I'm going to keep my remarks short because, like everyone else here, I'm looking forward to hearing from you today, sir. You know, I spoke here in 2014, and it is incredible to see how much liberty has grown in that short time already. You know, Virginia's struggling right now. There aren't many places around the Commonwealth where you see construction cranes dotting the skyline. There are some. Tyson's Corner outside our nation's capital is one. <laughs> Richmond, our, the Commonwealth's capital, is another. And then there's Liberty University, where there are cranes all over the place. <laughs> and that is a testament to President Falwell's continuous leadership and building on the good work of Dr. Boric and, of course, on the vision of Dr. Falwell Sr. for this great university. And in fact, it's not only a matter of building buildings and infrastructure, it's also attracting talent. And I have to tell you, I am so happy to be on the stage today with my friend Robert Hurt, and it is so exciting to me that he is leading the Center for Law and Policy here, the new Center for Law and Policy, because I can tell you, Robert Hurt served with honor and distinction in our General Assembly and in the United States Congress, and he will do the same here at Liberty, and I appreciate his friendship so much. And let me say, too, it's always good to be with my friend Bob Goodlatte, who is a leader for us, for all Virginians. I grew up in a traditional Irish Catholic family. And my faith is central to my life. I've always loved the sacraments of my church and the beauty of the Mass. But the truth is, I was not raised to talk about my personal relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Happily, over time, it's become more natural and comfortable for me to do so. And I am glad to be able to share with you today how that relationship sustains me in difficult times in hopes that that may be in some ways helpful to you. Romans 8.28 tells us, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. As I look back on my past, the first part of this verse explains a lot to me. All things, including defeats and unpleasant experiences, work for the good. Now, I suspect the Atlanta Falcons may have a hard time coming to terms with that today. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it is true. You see, some of the most disappointing moments in my life led to the best things that ever happened to me. You attend an incredible university, and I am sure that every single one of you had Liberty University at the top of your college application list and were ecstatic to get your acceptance notice here. My experience was a little different. My parents never went to college but they insisted that I do. So when I was a senior in high school, I had set my sights and my heart on getting into an elite liberal arts college in New England. In retrospect, <laughs> in retrospect, given my grades and SAT scores, it was well beyond my reach, but I convinced myself that I could get in. I didn't, and I was devastated. I ended up going to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Interesting tidbit, that's also where the current governor, Terry McAuliffe, went to school, but don't hold that against me. <laughs> Clearly I had the better professors there. <laughs> at, 
At freshman orientation, I met a girl and she was smart and funny and pretty. We dated and I fell in love and thought I would spend the rest of my life with her. But in our sophomore year, she transferred schools. We tried to keep the relationship going and on one visit to see her, she broke up with me. It's true. And I was heartbroken, despondent, thought that I'd never be happy again. I threw myself into my studies and into my work. I was working my way through school. One of my jobs was as a Senate parking lot attendant, parking the cars for the staff that work in the big office buildings on Capitol Hill. And that job led to an internship inside one of those buildings, a desk job, which led to a full-time job with a member of Congress. In 1985, after Ronald Reagan's landslide re-election, I, <laughs> I interviewed to be a press secretary for a couple of newly elected members of Congress. One of them was considered by the media to be a rising star. He'd worked in the Reagan White House, and conventional wisdom, wisdom had it that he was destined for greater things and higher office. The other one was, it's, it's, his election was considered to be a fluke. He was a former economics professor and thought to be a little eccentric. I wanted to work for the rising star, but he did not offer me the job. And so feeling rejected, I went to work for the somewhat nutty professor. <laughs> His name was Dick Armey, and I worked for him for more than a decade as he rose through the ranks to become the first Republican majority leader in the U.S. House of Representatives in more than 40 years. And that experience enabled me to serve as chairman of the Republican National Committee and then as counselor to the President of the United States, George W. Bush. When I worked, when I worked for President Bush during a very tough time in his presidency, he would often say, I couldn't do this job if it weren't for my faith. It's how I feel about being a husband, a father, and now a candidate. Oh, and I should tell you that rising star that I'd interviewed with in 85, he lost his next election and was never heard from again. Of course, I never would have worked on Capitol Hill had I not gone to Catholic University. Guess what? I didn't belong at an elitist secular college in Massachusetts. I belonged at a blue-collar Catholic school in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., I met one Kathy Hay, playing for a congressional softball team in the co-ed league. In May, now Kathy Gillespie and I will celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. <laughs> And we are more deeply in love today than on the day we were married and have three wonderful children. And Kathy is smarter, funnier, and prettier than any woman I've ever known, and she is my soulmate. You see, as it, as it turned out, those feelings of rejection devastation and heartbreak earlier in my life, while not fleeting, were temporary. And every one of them led to lasting acceptance, love, and fulfillment. Of course, I didn't know then what I know now. I wish I did. And I wish I'd had the relationship with the Lord then that I have now, because it would have helped me through trying times. Emotions are natural, but when you accept God's will, sadness need not give way to despair. Disappointment doesn't have to be bitter. And you can deal with rejection without losing self-worth. Knowing that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him is an effective coping mechanism, unlike scarfing down chocolate or binge-watching Netflix. <laughs> I suffered another rejection in 2014, losing my Senate race by eight-tenths of a percentage point. Not that anyone's counting. But I'm a better person for having run that race, and I'm a better candidate today for the experience. And after that disappointing loss, so many Virginians urged me to run for governor that at a certain point, I stopped feeling urged to run and started feeling called to serve. And that's where the second part of Romans comes in. 
for those who have been called according to his purpose. I believe in my campaign for governor I am called to his purpose. As I travel our commonwealth and talk to laid off coal miners, heroin addicts in recovery, parents of children trapped in failing schools, and young people struggling with student debt, I know I can make a difference, can make Virginia stronger and better, and stand for timeless principles and fundamental freedoms, including the protection of innocent life and the defense of our religious liberties. I don't yet know if it's God's will for me to be a servant leader, both a faithful servant and a good shepherd, as the next governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. But we will find out soon enough. The results are in. We just don't know them yet. I do know this. I am blessed, and so are you. And whatever disappointments may come our way, we can be sure that God has a plan for us. Jesus loves us. And in time, he will reveal that plan for us in time for us to revel in it. Thank you again for letting me join you here this morning. God bless you. God bless Liberty University. Go Flames. God bless the Commonwealth of Virginia, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you all so much. <laughs>